Hello, my name is Celia Halsey and I'm the Heritage Officer for CW Plus, which is the charity which supports Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. I would like today to take you in your imagination downstairs to the lower ground floor where the outpatient department waiting room is. Last year we opened an exhibition there telling the history and the story of Chelsea and Westminster Hospital stretching back 300 years. The hospital was founded in 1719 and has many, many stories to tell. Well, in the course of putting together that exhibition, we came across and we discovered and we conserved and restored a number of objects which we've now got on display. So I thought it'd be quite nice to give you a bit of a personal tour of the exhibition and we'll look in particular at the objects we've got on display there. Now they say that a picture tells a thousand words. I would like to suggest that maybe an object can tell even more if you know the stories behind them. So I'm going to show you a few pictures and let's begin our tour. And I'm starting off with a view of the exhibition. We've got a number of panels and there's a screen of uh, photographs which um, roll round. So there's lots to look at. And uh, it's perhaps quite a nice way to while away a wait in the outpatients department. So I'm going to take you through some of the objects. I want to start off with something which I think is absolutely key to this whole foundation of this hospital. And it's a chest and you can just see it in this picture. Um, it's just there, if you can see my little arrow. It's a black iron chest. Here's a picture of it just before we had it cleaned up and put on display. It was currently at that point down in the archives. We took this picture for the uh, exhibition designers who needed to know its exact size um, so that they could create a display cabinet for it. It weighs half a ton. Uh, well, not literally, but it's really heavy. So um, it had been down in the, ex in the archives for a number of years and was looking a bit sorry for itself, but it's got such a story to tell. It's an iron bound chest and it dates from, well, we know exactly when it came into the hospital's possession. It was given to the hospital on the 29th of March, 1732, which was only 13 years after the hospital had been founded. Uh, and it was to keep monies and documents safe within the hospital. There had been a number of years of quite financial strain on the hospital leading up to 1732. So I suspect that this um, chest was given to try and encourage um, economy and careful use of the money. The problems had been so great financially that there had been some new rules laid out by the Board of Governors at the time and some of those rules had been intended to cut costs and patients were expected those who uh, were able to, to assist in general nursing, washing the linen and ironing, cleaning the wards and assisting other patients. And they would be expelled from the hospital if they refused to do so. So you went into hospital and ended up nursing other patients. Also, they had to, have, had to restrict the amount of meat that uh, was on the menu for each patient down to only four days a week rather than seven. And the other days they had things like peas pudding and porridge. And then they had also had to issue instructions that any servant found to be carrying food or medicines away from the hospital should be dis dismissed instantly. So they'd had problems with uh, theft and pilfering. And I think this chest was sorely needed to bring a bit of financial order. But it also has a story to tell. This is a picture taken in about 1970, um, yeah, about 1970 or late 1960s. There was a historical symposium to mark the round about the 250th anniversary of the hospital. The chest had always had three key holders. This was a security thing. You had to have two um, trusted key holders present before you could open this chest of money. And um, 
thereby hangs quite a story because this chest is behind the establishment of what's now known as St George's Hospital. In 1733 there was quite a major split between the medical staff and the governors. They all fell out over the positioning of where a new hospital should be placed. There were some governors who wanted it to be on Hyde Park Corner, which was nearer their wealthy clients. And there were others who thought it should be in the depths of what was then quite um, impoverished Westminster. And there was a huge split and most of the medical staff and half the trustees upped and left and went off to found what became St George's Hospital. One of them was a Captain Hudson who was a key holder and we have an exchange of letters between the newly established St George's Hospital trustees and the Westminster Hospital trustees. It, it came almost to um, a, legal, a legal wrangle but in the end Captain Hudson gave up his key and it was returned to Westminster on condition that the money inside this chest should be used as had been intended by the donors to relieve the poor and needy. So there's a great breakdown in trust, I think. But um, that chest has a lot to say for, um, for financial management, for trust amongst governors, and even for the founding of a whole hospital. Well, this little item is much more recent. It dates probably from the late 1920s and it was a collecting box until, until the founding of the, um, the NHS in 1948. It was a constant problem for fundraising. It was an entirely charitable foundation and fundraising went on continuously. Well, there was an annual flag day and uh, this uh, would have been a street collection. But I think it's quite interesting because it's been well used and there have been uh, paper, um, sort of sheets of paper pasted over it over the years. But the, the one at the bottom we discovered have these, this rather strange emblem, which was used for fundraising of a nurse with her back to you, holding a collecting box behind her back. Um, we'll see it again in a moment in another picture, but it's quite interesting. Well, the flags would have been in the tray around the edge. And they look like this. Um, this is two tiny, tiny little um, fundraising flags that we've got in the collection. And the flag always showed Billy the cat. Billy the cat was Matron's cat and she was, apparently, he, sorry, it was the um, descendant of a long line of mouses who had prowled the corridors of Westminster Hospital for, they believed, 100 years at the time. So Billy was the latest descendant. And here are some nurses all dressed up, parading down what I think is Shaftesbury Avenue. And the lady in the middle with the first doll was a West End actress who was giving her support to the flag day. And uh, I've looked closely at this photograph and um, it was taken on mascot day, Billy the mascot, Billy the cat, on the 4th of June. And I think it's probably the late 1920s. We haven't got a year, unfortunately. They're obviously having a lot of fun. Apparently groups of medical students used to prowl Waterloo and Victoria stations on Derby Day, getting up to all sorts of hijinks, often in um, fancy dress as well. There was one year that they uh, hijacked or uh, kidnapped rather uh, a very popular uh, cartoon character, uh, Pip Squeak and Wilfred from the Daily Mail. And he disappeared from the pages of the Daily Mail and was held to ransom uh, for in aid of Westminster Hospital. And uh, readers could donate money to Westminster Hospital as a ransom to get their favorite cartoon back onto the pages of the Daily Mail. Lots of fun, I think. Well, I'm going to move on to another artefact here we've got on display. This is the Knight Porter's chair. Um, we know it stood in the previous hospital, which was occupied um, in Broad Sanctuary, a site on Broad Sanctuary opposite Westminster Abbey up until 1939. And I believe from other sources that it dates from about 1860s. 
it's uh, the night porter was and to an extent still is uh, both a role of service and of security to the hospital so this would have been where he sat near the door uh, out of the drafts that's why it's uh, surrounded like that but it's been quite a feature of the hospital i think for a number of years um, look under the photograph i found recently i only found came across this um, a week or so ago and look who is sitting in the porter's chair so i think um fundraising has been as i say part of the hospital throughout its history up until the founding of the nhs and here is minnie mouse who had been sitting in the porter's chair and that is walt disney who visited the the hospital uh, in 1937 and he gave permission for Mickey and Minnie Mouse to be used as a fundraising um, activity uh, event on that day. On the same day I'm told they filmed a number of medical staff and students, student nurses on the steps of the hospital opposite Westminster Abbey and that shot of film became a crowd scene in a Mickey Mouse film called The Valiant Taylor, which was a starred Minnie, uh, Minnie and Mickey Mouse. So there we are, featured in a Mickey Mouse film. Well, moving on to 1939, the time had come to move the hospital again uh, to a brand new site on St John's Gardens. This was a hospital which had been um, long needed. The old site was well loved, but had become inadequate for growing numbers and changing medical um, facilities. So in 1939, the new hospital was opened by King George VI. And this is an electric bell push, which he rang to open the new hospital. And it had a, um, a plaque put around the edge to commemorate the day. We've got this on display downstairs. And that's the hospital that he actually opened at the time. It was uh, state of the art. It had seven stories. The wards, unusually or um, quite revolutionary for its time, the design was each ward was adjacent to its relevant outpatients department. So it was a very short walk across a corridor from the outpatients into the wards if a consultant needed to admit a patient. Um, in the basement, there was a radiotherapy unit for the treatment of cancer. And on the roof, uh, the kind of building on the top of the roof in a way, was the chapel and the pathology lab. You can just see the chapel, the end wall of the chapel there. Well, King George VI gave a speech, and uh, this is a picture of him about to give that speech. The uh, opening ceremony was held in a huge marquee on a site which was to become part of the hospital later, but at that time was unbuilt on, on Page Street at the back of the hospital. And they, um, you can tell, you can just see the marquee poles there. And this is the king standing up to give his speech. And in the exhibition, we have the original copy of the speech that he gave. And it's rather, it's rather nice, actually, because it's a very personal speech that he gave. Um, he, was a, he was particularly keen to note that the hospital had great personal connection with his own family. And so I'm just going to read out a little bit. It's a bit small for you to read there, but I shall read out a little bit of what it says. He begins by congratulating the governors and the board and the executive for their great achievement in the opening of the hospital. And then he says, there are, however, more personal reasons for my pleasure in being here today. I am patron of this hospital and the link with our household is a close one for any member who needs treatment is accommodated in its wards. Moreover, the new nurses' home, which was opened by my mother, Queen Mary, now bears her name. And to mark the present occasion, I have agreed that the children's wing of the new hospital should bear the names of my daughters and be known as the Princess Elizabeth Wing and the Princess Margaret Rose Wing. 
So he was particularly keen to, to note how many members of his own family were connected with the hospital. Well, little was he to know that in a few years time, that close connection became even more personal because the king himself needed an operation in 1951 and Westminster Hospital supplied all the uh, uh, medical staff that he needed and even moved an operating theatre to Buckingham Palace to operate on the king. This is a picture of the nurses who assisted in that operation and then nursed him in his convalescence. It was top secret at the time. Nobody knew what was going on. It didn't make the news until after he was recovered. And even the colleagues of these nurses did not know where they had gone. And uh, there was much puzzlement that some of the operating uh, equipment seemed to have disappeared and no one knew where gone off to Buckingham Palace. So this is a picture of nurse Sarah Minter shaking hands with matron Lavinia Young to say a job well done. And uh, it was very much appreciated. Anyone who has perhaps seen the early episodes in The Crown, Netflix, um, would have seen that this episode of the King's Operation was covered in quite some detail actually, and it's all true. Well, we're moving on to the Second World War, and uh, this is a helmet we have on display, which was used by doctors during the Blitz. Well, certainly throughout the war, um, doctors were issued with steel helmets to protect them from uh, whilst on duty. Whilst we're quite used to the idea that people had to go down to air raid shelters when the air raid sirens went, doctors remained on duty and were just given a helmet and had to continue. And this is a picture of a drill, an air raid drill at the beginning of the war. And this is young doctors running to their posts, carrying their steel helmets uh, on duty to continue throughout any air raid that was coming. They look like they're quite enjoying themselves there. That's because this was a drill. This was not for real. I, I think when the real thing came, it was far less amusing. <laughs> well, also there were medical students who were called upon to volunteer as fire watching duty. They had to spend uh, shifts up on the roof looking out for incendiary bombs uh, to prevent fires. And uh, I was fortunate enough to speak to uh, a young well, he wasn't young, uh, speak to a doctor who had been a medic, a young medic during the war. And uh, I had a wonderful conversation with him in his 90s. And he recalls doing just this. And I'd like to share with you what he actually said. Uh, I had another student were up on the roof and an incendiary bomb came flaming down. So my colleague, I must say, he's quicker than me got a spade and put it in a bucket of sand, put it out. The other thing we did, which we never think, each time we did this, we got, uh, uh, you know, we slept in the hospital. There was a billiard room up on the top floor, uh, which w w was full of beds in the wall. <laughs> so we, uh, people who were on duty got uh, a free, got a free night's bed there, and. Seven and sixpence in those days. <laughs> yeah, that was all right, you see. Um, I think it was three course dinner with soup in the evening, was uh, half a crown, two and sixpence, and bre nice three course breakfast was one and sixpence. That's a lovely story. I think um, it really brought it to life for me when I heard him tell me that story. Well, I'd like to show you this plaque now, which is actually not on display in the exhibition, but we have put it up outside the Mercury Children's Ward. It's a ceramic plaque um, showing a bambini, which is an Italian word for a baby. Uh, it's the traditional em emblem for paediatric nursing, and it has been since the 15th century. It, it was a design which was made by the sculptor Della Robbia for the Foundling Hospital in uh, Florence. Well, it's over the years become a recognised symbol of sick children. And this 
um, plaque came from the Westminster Children's Hospital, which was on Vincent Square and was part of Westminster Hospital from 1948. It had been founded in uh, 1905. Um, and these plaques decorated the whole of the outside of the building and over several of the doors inside as well. So we were, uh, we were very pleased to have one of these in the archives. We felt it was really important that it should be on display again outside the paediatric wards today. This is the children's hospital um, today it, on Vincent Square. Uh, there you can see a plaque over the door of what was once the nurse's home for the children's hospital. And uh, the other picture is of the actual nurse's hospital itself. And the, the uh, bay windows on the corner were specially designed to make sure there was lots of daylight within the wards. And this is a picture from the 19, uh, late 1920s um, of the inside of one of those children's wards and you can see that, that bay window. And what strikes me um, is the lack of equipment. There's, we're so used to so much medical equipment around hospital beds today, but this is just cots and cribs and some toys and some dedicated nurses. Shows how nursing has changed over the years. Now this little item has seen really good service. It's called a monaural stethoscope. It's what doctors used to use before they had the familiar stethoscope, which goes in both ears. This just goes into one ear. It's like a listening tube, if you like. It's made of wood. Uh, and it's been carved very carefully with the name A.H. Evans. In fact, these are a, a kind of a version of these is still used by midwives today when they want to listen to a baby's heartbeat without hearing the mother's heartbeat. And uh, they do a very good job. But uh, this belonged to A.H. Evans, who was a surgeon at the hospital. Uh, he qualified from Westminster Medical School in 1899. And carried on as a surgeon there until 1936 when he retired. He was really well loved. He was a brilliant student. He won nearly all the prizes going when he was at medical school, but he had quite an adventure at the start of his career. He uh, had only been qualified for a year in 1900 when he uh, received a sort of summons by telephone from his former tutor and he was summoned to Liverpool Street Station and asked to join a group of other medical people in the Imperial Yeomanry Field Hospital, uh, a company going out with troops to the Boer War in South Africa. So he didn't really have much choice and so he joined the uh, troop ship and they set sail to Cape Town in April 1900. Well, when they were two days out of Cape Town, they had a bit of a disaster. They hit a fog bank and they collided with a mail ship, the MS Mexican, and the mail ship sank and 274 people ended up in the sea. They rescued 274 people and brought them on board the troop ship. They were no doubt looked, looked after quite well by the medics on board. And so that wasn't a very good start to the campaign in South Africa, but they arrived safely after two more days at sea. And immediately had to set off with a mule train. They trekked 1,300 miles with mule trains. This is a picture which I found in the archives of the Imperial War Museum. And uh, it shows uh, the Royal Army Medical Corps, uh, a mule train of equipment and wagons trekking across the South African veldt. Well, whilst they had been trekking for nearly two months, they were taken captive by a Boer commando unit and held captive for a week. They, before they had even got to their destination, they were then rescued by British troops and finally made it to the station where they stayed another year. And uh, they cared for wounded soldiers before finally making it back to, to London. A.H. Evans was uh, continued as a surgeon and was deeply loved. He, he 
specialized, well, he didn't really specialize um, in any one area of surgery, but he did conduct several quite pioneering operations. He was said that, it was said that the only fault he had was that he had not a shred of worldly ambition. So I think it was felt he could have gone, he could have gone really far in his, in his career, but he stayed at Westminster all his career. I love this artifact that we've got on display. It's so evocative of its time and another era of nursing. It's a nurse's cape and uh, they carried on wearing these until about the 1980s. It's made of wool and has this glorious bright red lining. The straps crossed over at the front and buttoned around the back. So there was a very distinctive crisscross uh, at the front when it was being worn. Um, nurses had been given a uniform very early on in Westminster Hospital uh, in about the 80, early 1870s. And by and large, the uniform didn't really change for a hundred years. These capes were uh, part of the uniform right back at the beginning. They were worn over the uniform for nurses to walk between the nurses' home and the wards and back again. When um, they were going further afield or they were going on public transport, they'd have worn a longer navy blue cloak with a navy blue bonnet as well. As I said, these uh, cloaks, capes had a bright red lining. And at Westminster, there was the tradition that on Christmas Eve, the nurses would turn their capes inside out, so the red lining showed, and they would sing Christmas carols around the wards. And here they are processing down some stairs with their lanterns over their shoulders. It was a well-loved tradition. It went on until quite recent memory. Well, the uniforms, um, are always spoken about very fondly. Whenever we've spoken to retired nurses, everyone remembers their uniform uh, with, in great detail and with great fondness. They, they were um, very indicative of, of your status and uh, where you were with your training, and it changed as you went through your training. This is um, a nurse called Pat Marriott, who has very kindly allowed us to use her photograph. She trained at Westminster Nurses Nursing School in 1973 and this is I think when she was in her first year and uh, she recalled in great detail um, her uniform and how it changed so I'd like to share with you what what she said. The uniform of course was a bit different because we wore the white aprons. These these collars attached and they they were very stiff so they cut into your neck when they were fresh and then you had a stud here and then you have straps going over and you, you had to keep pinning everything. And this, this cap starts off as an ordinary oblong piece of material which you had to make up into this cap which sat round here and then came out at the back which prevented you from ever sitting in an armchair comfortably. So um, that, that was all different. One of the uses of those aprons was that you could turn up a corner of them and write notes on them. <laughs> the dress would be the same. Um, when you were a third year student nurse, you had a belt and, and the Westminster buckle. We were under contract to work for four years. And after the three years um, you would be qualified you know, as a state registered nurse then and then you lost your straps so that you could have um, maybe it's after the fourth year if you stayed on to be a staff nurse you, you lost your straps and you just had this bib up the top and then when you were qualified you also had one of these lace caps so the patients, the doctors, the other staff would know exactly how qualified or otherwise or what stage of training you were at. And that's actually very valuable. That's really evocative of her, her memories are really sharp about the uniform. Well, 
the uniform adjusted over the years. The, the skirts got shorter. <laughs> um, this picture I think was taken in the mid to late 70s because by then the, um, Pat talked about her um, student nurse cap being a folded piece of fabric. Well, by the late 70s, the student nurses had got more um, paper, like paper caps, um, slightly less elaborate. This is a picture, I think, taken in the mid to late 70s of three nurses. You've got three stages of qualification there. Looking at the nurse on the left, uh, she is a fully qualified staff nurse. She's got her belt buckle. Uh, she has no straps to her apron and her cap is a prized frilly cap. Um, all qualified nurses were given this quite stiff netting and lace cap which was held up with wires to make it stiff and uh, it was only worn once you were fully qualified as a staff nurse. In the middle we've got a, probably a first year student. You can see she has no buckle and she's got straps over her shoulders. She's got a paper cap on. Um, and then on the right, you've got a third year nurse. She's got her buckle and she's still wearing straps, but her cap has a blue stripe around it to show she's in her final year, or she's just qualified, but she's not a staff nurse yet. And this is the prized Westminster buckle. It shows the Westminster port colors and uh, was worn with great, as I say, great pride and treasured. The Westminster Children's Hospital had a circular buckle with that bambini, that little swaddled child in the middle. Um, and I'm, I'm told that when you were wearing this, it did tend to, the points of the Westminster buckle did tend to catch in your sleeve. You can imagine that it did. And we've come to the end of our tour. Uh, it's just another picture there of the actual exhibition itself. I do hope you perhaps one day get a chance to uh, have a look around it and uh, we'll enjoy looking at a bit more detail because we have a few other items on display as well. It's been really lovely to share this with you. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm going to be doing a couple more in the series called Wonderful Westminster. Uh, the next one is going to be about some wonderful times in Westminster's history. The, the hospital's history. So uh, I hope you'll join me for that. It's been lovely to, to join you today. <laughs>